Okay, so the idea of this first clip is to give you a wide angle overview of the languages of South Asia. Now this topic, just like just about everything else in this part of the world, is complex, it's chaotic, it's multicolored, it's totally overwhelming, but it's still really beautiful, I think. Now to start with, let's just check out this stat. The 2001 Census of India lists 122 different major languages in the country of India and 1,599 minor languages and dialects. And this is just for one country in the region of South Asia. Now, given this staggering amount of linguistic diversity, how can we even get started thinking about language? Well, I'd like to start with a very simple question, and maybe it's one that you've never really thought about. What exactly are languages anyway? We all have at least one of them, and we all use them pretty effectively. Maybe some of us uh, use them better than others, but I'd say most of us on the whole do all right. Now, even though we all know what a language is, it's kind of hard to describe this thing called language in abstract terms, right? Well, one way to define languages is as naturally developed systems of verbal communication. What I mean by that is that we use these bits and bobs that are called words in a systematic way. We make sentences out of them based on a distinct set of rules that we already just kind of know as adults. If other people happen to know how our code works and what our words mean, then they can decipher the message that we've encoded in this sentence. This is what constitutes a successful act of linguistic communication. This is language. Now, I've bracket out, bracketed two ideas in this definition that you might notice. One is verbal and the other is naturally developed. Languages don't have to be based on oral sounds. For example, there's sign language, right? Uh, there's also artificial languages like Esperanto or Klingon. <laughs> but most of the time, when linguists study languages, they're talking about the ones that are spoken by people and ones that have evolved naturally in human cultures around the world. Our world, not the Klingon home planet. Okay, so now that we know what a language is, I want to say two more things that I think are important to talk about. First, we should keep in mind that language is not necessarily tied to ethnicity. Anyone can learn any language, no matter who you are, no matter the color of your skin. It's true that the first language you learn is usually the language of your biological parents, unless you're adopted, right? Uh, and, it's, and this first language gets kind of hard-coded in your brain as you grow and mature. So language is or it can be tied to ethnic background in that way. But it doesn't mean that it has to be your only language. There are plenty of people who learn and adopt new languages that have no relation to their ethnicity. And there's adoption, too, as, we, as I mentioned. Second, languages are not the same as scripts. Often people get confused about those two things. Languages are oral for the most part, while scripts are written symbols that try to capture oral language. Many languages can share the same script. There's Roman script that's used for like English, French, German, and so on. In India, modern Hindi, Marathi, Sanskrit are all written in Devanagari script. But the written form is, all, is always a simulacra of the spoken language. It's an imitation of these oral sounds. Also, language can be written in any script. So Sanskrit is usually written in Devanagari, but it can also be written in Roman script or Thai or Sinhalese or Nepali or Tamil or Burmese or Chinese uh, even, or even in the Perso-Arabic script. It was written that way in the Mughal period. Okay. So now, with all that out of the way, once we move to looking at the hundreds of languages of South Asia, the first thing that we'll notice is that they can be divided into four distinct language families. A language family is actually not really much different than your family or my family or any other family. It's a set of sister languages that are genetically related to one another. By this, I mean that they have a, they've naturally evolved from a same parent language, a mother language, let's say. In South Asia, there's four of these families. Uh, and by the way, notice that today I'm calling everything South Asia and not India. 
This is because languages don't know political boundaries. And a lot of these languages are found today in modern Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and not just the country of India. So when we're talking about the present day, we, sh we should be careful not to just say India, but South Asia. Anyway, back to our four language families. They're called Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, Mundari, or Austroasiatic, and Tibeto-Burman. They're all fascinating, and we'll look at each of them one by one. But before we do, I want to again emphasize that they're not necessarily connected to ethnicity. There aren't biological differences between the speakers of the four language families, uh, although we can discern cultural differences sometimes between, say, North Indians and South Indians. But biologically, there's always been plenty of intermixture between uh, these speakers of these languages. These are languages, not races. Okay. So let's start looking at each one of the language families one by one, starting with the biggest, which is called Indo-Aryan. Here again, I want to emphasize that we shouldn't take Aryan to denote a race. It did get used that way by Europeans, especially in the 19th century, and it's kind of an unfortunate residue of all of those colonial ways of thinking. Um, but when linguists talk, when, when linguists use the word Indo-Aryan, it's really just an artificial label. We could just as easily substitute it with another word like Sanskritic, maybe. And maybe actually that might be a better word to use. Uh, but anyhow, Indo-Aryan is the word that linguists use now. And uh, those are the languages primarily found in northern India or Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. Uh, and you'll notice that there's one outlier all the way down south in Sri Lanka called Sinhala. That one seems to have gotten down there when a group of Buddhists migrated down from eastern India, the eastern coast of India, about 2,000 years ago. The major modern languages belonging to this family are Hindi-Urdu, which is one of the two national languages of India and has over 473 million speakers in India. Others include Bengali, Marathi, Gujarati, Punjabi, which is, Punjabi, of course, feels like the Indian national language here in Vancouver, since there's so many Punjabi speakers, and many, many of the folks in our class as well, I'm sure. Uh, but while there are 29 million Punjabi speakers in India, which is almost the same as the population of Canada, it's only the fifth largest language group in India. Anyhow. All the Indo-Aryan languages came from the classical language of Sanskrit, just like how all the Romance languages of Europe, like French, Italian, Spanish, and so on, all have descended from Latin. The one twist in South Asia is that the Indo-Aryan languages also have what are called aerial influences of Persian, Arabic, and English that have altered the vocabulary sets. Uh, so that's why you get a language like Urdu, which almost feels like Persian in its vocabulary. But the core of these languages, even Urdu, comes from Sanskrit. The grammar still comes from Sanskrit. The second major language family in South Asia is called the Dravidian family. These are mostly spoken in southern India. But then there's also an outlier named Brahui that you see all the way in the upper left corner of the map. Uh, this is a language spoken by uh, kind of herdsmen, herd, herding communities in Baluchistan all the way in Pakistan. And it's actually kind of in the area of those old Indus Valley sites. So you can imagine what the speculation was. This is a survival of that very old Indus Valley culture many thousands of years later, maybe. Who knows? Maybe so. Either way, it's kind of fascinating uh, to figure out why it's there. Anyway, these all descended from a single common ancestor that we call proto Dravidian. Sometimes people call it Old Tamil. All four of the big Dravidian languages, I should note, have developed really rich literary traditions in their own languages, and they've produced some really unbelievable ancient poetry, dance, drama. I highly encourage you to check it out if you get the chance. Now, turning quickly to the third, the Mundari family, this is a set of uh, languages of tribal communities, uh, kind of uh, rural communities that are located in the jungles of central and eastern India, spoken by relatively small populations. They're all unwritten and have been passed down orally for thousands of years. 
Nowadays, though, because of modernization and, stand, and the standardized Indian national education system, many Mundari languages are threatened with extinction as younger speakers uh, choose English or Hindi instead. Uh, it's a bit like indigenous languages in Canada. Um, a few of these Mundari languages have already gone extinct. Uh, perhaps the current Indian government actually is far less sympathetic to their vulnerability than we are here in Canada. All the Mundari languages also would have come from a single common ancestor, which you could call Proto-Mundari. There's a fascinating theory, actually an alternate theory, that Proto-Mundari was the original language of the Indus Valley and not Proto-Dravidian, as other people think. Finally, I just want to mention a fourth lang language family that usually gets totally neglected when talking about languages in South Asia. Even your readings actually have ignored them, and these are the Tibeto-Burman languages. As you can see from the map, this family has a very diverse tree. There's many little tiny isolated subgroups within the indigenous communities in the mountainous areas of Nepal, northeastern India, um, Burma, of course, Myanmar, but they've also spread all across into Southeast Asia as well. The major language of this group is Tibetan, uh, but also Newari in Nepal is quite prominent, uh, and in India, Manipuri and Bodo account for the largest speakers of these languages. So there you have it, the four big language families of South Asia. In our next segment, we're going to take a closer look at what historical linguists have discovered about the biggest one of these, the Indo-European language family. So see you in a minute.